Oh, it started already. Oh, <laughs> no, okay, it's fine. All right, thank you everyone for joining us today, and thank you, Professor Russell Goodo, for accepting our invitation. Professor Russell Goodo is a professor of metallurgy from the University of Sheffield. And actually, we just heard from him last week, I think, about the International Student Conference in Metallic Materials. Yes. So if any of us are interested interested in that conference, you, and you, you can ask for more information from Russell. And today, Russell is going to give us a talk about filler metals for brazing and how to design better brazing alloys by avoiding intermetallics and using ideas from high entropy alloy research. So now let's welcome Professor Goodell to give us to take over the screen. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Just before I start, one thing to check. Am I aiming for about half an hour for the for the talk? Yeah, it can be 40 minutes. OK, that's that's good because uh, I <laughs> I intended it to be half an hour, but looking at it, I think maybe it could be a bit longer. So we'll see. I'll, I'll do my best to uh, be nice not to, to keep it pretty longer than they need to be. But yes, thank you very much for that for that introduction and the plug for the uh, the conference um, and also uh, indeed for the invitation to speak today. Um, my name is, as I say, Russell Goodall, and you see on the slide a name of a number of my um, research associates and students uh, who work with me on this. And I should also acknowledge uh, Ed Pickering from the University of Manchester, who's been and continues to be co-supervisor of, of some of those students with uh, some good input into this work. So brazing filler metals is my title. And what I want to talk about today was, first of all, the brazing and explain what that is. You might know, but just make sure. And then to zoom in on the filler metal side and say what I mean by by fillers. Um, and then to to carry on with that, I wanted to talk about some examples from the work that we've been doing in this area um, about trying to avoid intermetallics in um, in the joint. And that's uh, where I'll say a little bit about high entropy alloys. Um, also trying to decrease the temperature of uh, fillers operating at and also to increase the temperature. Um, two of the different challenges that we've tried to uh, um, deal with. So brazing, first of all, brazing is a really old uh, technology. It's uh, been around for thousands of years and you, know, you can trace it back uh, 5000 years or something, something like that. It's a way of joining two pieces of material, often metals, but but not always. You start off by bringing those two pieces of, of metal um, together um, with uh, a certain distance between them. You clean that surface and then you need to get rid of the, the oxide. Certainly if it's a, if it's a metal, uh, most of them have a, a surface oxide and that will impede most brazing processes. So you might use a vacuum, you might use a reducing atmosphere if you have access to uh, a furnace that can do that. Um, or you might use a substance called a flux. Um, this is a, a uh, often a salt actually, something that can be melted, flow into the gap, uh, react with that oxide, dissolve it and sort of clean that surface uh, ready for the filler metal, which is what you introduce next. You, uh, you put the filler metal, uh, you heat the joint, you obviously probably have to heat it to get the flux to work anyway, but you, you carry on heating that joint, um, you introduce the filler metal, the filler metal melts and then is drawn into that gap by capillary action um, and displaces the flux as it does so. And then you cool down and you end up with your two pieces of material and the solidified filler metal in between them forming a joint. That is the, the, the brazing process. There are many different variations, flux or no flux, type of heating, various things like that, joint design as well. But that's the core of the brazing process. So um, brazing is, well, despite being old, it's, it's still used. And it's used because it has certain um, very key and specific advantages. Um, you produce metallic bonds, so the bonds are uh, electrically conductive, they're, they're thermally conductive, they're quite high strength, that can be important. You can, and this is perhaps one of the key advantages, you can jo join dissimilar materials. So you can join different alloys, you can join metals to ceramics, ceramics to ceramics, not with 
without any limitations whatsoever, but certainly with a very, very wide array of different joining possibilities. You can also make uh, joins between quite complex uh, joints, and that can include uh, joints where you can't um, you can't see um, the, the 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 joint. You can't get a maybe a laser beam or electron beam into it. Um, you could do several joints at the same time. Um, that's one of the advantages for, uh, say, soldering, which is a, a related process to to brazing um, in the electronics industry. Is you can do many many joints rapidly. Um, you can also join thick components to thin components because you're not actually melting the material that you're joining. The joints can be taken apart and that could have some implications for recyclability and things like that. And also another key uh, advantage is that the, the parent materials, the materials you're joining, are basically unaffected by the process hopefully if you get it right so you can join it you can join materials without affecting uh, microstructural change upon them which of course can also be an advantage if you've got particularly optimized microstructures um so where is brazing used well, all sorts of different specific applications um it's used in jewelry silver soldering they call it but the the temperatures involved are um are brazing temperatures um, it's uh, likely, possibly, uh, to have a, a role in uh, infusion technology. Some of the joints there between different materials may require brazing. Um, this uh, section of a turbine blade down here is an interesting example. Um, it's not used in turbine blade manufacture especially, but this is actually a repair. It's a, a ground-based uh, turbine for uh, electrical generation from steam, and the white lines you can see in that are cracks, and it's been repaired, it's been rejoined. The, the, the broken components have been rejoined by a brazing process, um, and that can extend the lifetime. It's used in ground-based turbines because of obviously the, the sort of the, the safety case um, for air, for aerospace is a bit different but it does have a, a valuable role there um, other components uh, also aerospace we've got the the honeycombs joining thick to thin some of the complicated parts in fuel nozzles um, this article at the middle bottom is a, a tool so joining the say the tungsten carbide tool tip onto the body that's done by brazing uh, these components in the middle are some electrical ports for vacuum technology where you need to combine conductive metals with insulating ceramics and have a gas tight seal. So that uses brazing. Um, and the final component down there is a heat exchanger. So quite a broad array of different components um, which depend on brazing really, uh, or certainly for which brazing is a, a very important technology. OK, so I then said we'd move on to the, the filler metals. So this is the bit that melts and actually sort of does the brazing. Um, so a filler metal, well, it's going to need to to wet when it's molten. It needs to uh, it needs to be happy being in contact with the metals and the materials it's going to bond it might need to flow as well. And it's going to need to produce a joint. If it doesn't produce a joint. It's clearly no use. Um, it's also going to have to survive whatever the operating conditions are, the temperature, the stresses, any corrosive or oxidizing environments, anything like that. Um, and it's going to be have to be compatible with processing that suits the materials that are being joined. So not too high temperature, not too reactive, um, those kind of considerations. And of course, if there are um, regulations in that particular domain, then it will have to comply with those. Um, many uh, filler metals of 30, 40 years ago would have had cadmium in them, but that's been largely phased out because of the, uh, the toxicity requirements, for example. Um, now, because of those broad array of different requirements, which are different for many different applications, there are lots of different filler metals out there, and they can be quite complicated alloys. So these uh, sort of uh, uh, radar charts uh, show different families, uh, low temperature fillers based on aluminium and magnesium, silver based, high temperature ones that can be based on gold, palladium, nickel, uh, and then the copper based fillers. All sorts of different alloys are used and some of them have actually quite, quite a lot of elements in them and quite complicated um, compositions in order to achieve the properties that are needed. 
Um, we can look a little bit more at actually how these things work. Um, if we we take a look at actual braised joints, here are some examples. Um, this is both using a, a certain a silver based filler called AG155 in the in the standards. Um, the, the filler, the silver filler is the, the bottom half and it's been bonded to something at the top. Uh, in this in the the first image, it's uh, it's copper. And in that case, this particular filler, it's got copper in it. It alloys with the copper. You can sort of see in the micrograph, there's a, a slightly hazy zone as it's, uh, we've got this interaction, some um, dissolution and diffusion happening between the two that's, um, that's helping to make that bond. But that's not essential. Um, we can also use this filler to bond to steels. In the steels case, we don't get particular Inter, inter alloying or diffusion, we rather get the formation of some intermetallics, this line of compounds forming at the surface. We get intermetallic formation through reaction between the two, and it's that that makes the bond um, in that particular case. So different things can happen. It's not a uniform picture by any means, but it does. Both of these instances would fulfill those requirements for fillers that I set out earlier. Um, so what might we want to do? Uh, clearly, brazing does a lot. It does some good stuff. It's a good technology, but uh, I've talked about us working on it. So there's clearly things we might want to improve. Um, and of course, we want to improve any of those particular behaviours, any of those key behaviours, um, perhaps for new applications on new materials. Um, sometimes wetting isn't very good. The known fillers don't respond well to all materials, particularly new materials. So we might need to develop new fillers as a result. They're, the joints are actually pretty strong. They're not as strong as a, a well, but they're stronger than, a, than a, an adhesive or something like that. So um, the strength isn't, isn't too bad, but it could be better. We might want to improve the strength. Uh, we might want to adapt the melting temperatures. We might want to increase the melting temperature um, because applications demand often higher temperatures, or we might want to reduce the melting temperatures to make our processing easier. Um, and also, of course, price. Price is uh, always something we'd like to bring down. And some of those fillers, some of them use gold, some of them use palladium, some of them use silver. And these are ones that are, you know, not not ultra rare or extremely specialist examples. They're, they're used uh, moderately widely. Um, and of course, the price of those is very volatile. The, the graph there shows um, for the last uh, 20 years or so how the, the blue line, the price of silver has varied. And it's, it's you know, relatively volatile, um, obviously tracking the inversely tracking the, the state of the global economy. So when um, when the economy suffers a shock, as it has done at the moment, uh, the price of silver and gold as well will, will go up and that can make those those fillers a lot more expensive for the applications they're used in. So these are the sorts of things we want to achieve, and I'm going to talk about a few examples of things we've tried to do in this sort of area. So the first example I wanted to mention was the idea of trying to reduce intermetallics, and this is in particular um, in, um, in brazing nickel or brazing super alloys. Uh, so the sort of the jet engine type or, or um, aerospace type uses at least. Now, in those kind of alloys, the, the filler metals that are used for brazing nickel, um, we have many of the same elements that we might find in a super alloy, but to bring the melting temperature down so we don't end up melting the materials we want to join, uh, the standard compositions often use boron and silicon. Um, and these are added in um, to reduce the melting temperature. So a fairly typical one, nickel 620, um, has nickel chrome iron, but it's also got some silicon and some boron in there. And they're very effective. They do reduce the melting temperature so that we can get that alloy to melt well before um, grades of super alloy. But they also leave behind intermetallic silicides and borides. And if those are concentrated along the center of the joint, so this is uh, two pieces of super alloy and the, the line in the middle is the um, um, is the joint line and this middle bit here where we get the eutectic around there there can be uh, the formation of, of intermetallics which can harm 
the mechanical performance. So we want to get rid of those if we can, or reduce their amount at very least. Now in doing this, and in fact in doing quite a lot of our work, we've um, drawn upon the ideas of, of high entropy alloys, and I'm sure you've, you've heard about these. You may work on these yourself or have encountered them um, in, your, in your, your research, or you may just have heard about them. But very briefly, these are um, alloys where we have multiple elements, um, and there isn't really a main element that we can say dominates that composition. So it could be, for example, equiatomic cobalt, chrome, iron, nickel, aluminium, the same amount, the same uh, proportion of atoms of each of those combined together. And these are, of course, very much uh, of interest at the moment. They've shown exciting properties and all of this sort of thing. And, and if you look, um, if you look at the citations that are coming in uh, for papers with high entropy alloy, we see this massively um, exploding rate of interest and, um, and uh, citations in the area. And this is the kind of graph that people do sometimes show when they want to say that their research area is um, exciting. I would just caution you to be to be a little bit careful of this kind of data, though, because um, when I was producing this this slide, this uh, the data here for the citations in high entropy alloys and how that's increasing, I decided to look at some other topics. And if you look, for example, at uh, tunnel boring, um, you see uh, a similar actual. There's not too different a rate. Uh, oops, wrong way. That way. So comparing the two, maybe ever so slightly higher for the HEAs, but not too different a rate in terms of the increase. The the baseline number is lower, but the increase is going up. Now, um, I'm not a, a geo um, technologist or anything. I don't know. Perhaps there are exciting advances in tunnel boring, but um, I think the point is that the volume of all research is increasing. Um, so the citations of everything are going up. But taking that aside, leaving that aside as a side point, HEAs are an exciting topic, a topic of interest in metallurgy, at least. Um, and they present, whoops, they present some potential advantages here. If we can get uh, one of the cited effects of high entropy alloys is um, uh, that this, the, the entropy of mixing, uh, promotes mixing. The, 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 the high entropy of having multiple uh, elements in similar amounts can promote the formation of a solid solution rather than distinct phases, rather than intermetallics. So there might be a route by using high entropy alloy type alloys to uh, have the, the melting point reduction effect that we want, but not get the intermetallics. So to, to get for the brazing situation, the lower melting temperatures, but not the problems with, with brittleness. So they present an advantage, but they also present a challenge uh, because there's a load of different alloys that we could explore. If I looked at filler metals in general, going back to those, those sort of uh, standard fillers that I showed earlier, there's about 23 elements that crop up in there, the, the elements listed there. And if I was to choose a five component alloy, um, that gives me more than 30,000 different systems to look at, different selections from those. And of course, if I if I want something that's not equiatomic and I want to vary the compositional levels, I could have millions of different alloys to, to search. So I can't really do this by random exploration or by making lots of alloys and hoping that one is going to work. I need some kind of clues to, to help me uh, to do that. So we have to have some sort of methodology behind our alloy design. And that's really like any kind of design process that we might do in engineering. We start off with some sort of requirement. We have a design. We come up with use what knowledge, what understanding we have to come up with a design. We make it. We test it. That might inform our understanding better or it, we may iterate our design and eventually we have something ready for use. And we try and this is how we try and do it with with our alloys. We get our requirements from our industrial partners. We uh, we make a design. Now for this, we use um, some relatively simple criteria that we can calculate based on the elements. Um, we calculate the enthalpy of mixing using uh, the Medema method, and we also calculate the average atomic size mismatch. Um, both of these 
are relatively simple. We can we can do this with a, a, a simple script, a Python script or similar. And by doing that, calculate these numbers for hundreds of thousands of compositions. We want the enthalpy of mixing to be small and slightly negative to, to try and promote mixing. And we want the atomic mis size mismatch to be as small as possible, also to promote uh, the formation of a solid solution rather than intermetallics. And this lets us go through very large numbers of compositions and discard the ones that have a very low chance of working. So um, this is what we do. We, we, uh, we apply that route to go through many uh, hundreds of thousands and take our best ones and then use uh, CalFAD to, to learn more about them, to learn about their melting temperatures, uh, a bit more about their phase compositions and things like that. We, we use Thermocalc and we've found um, the best results for this kind of still quite screening sort of stage. We're not worried about absolute precision. We want some answers that will help us move on uh, to the next stage. Uh, we find the solid solution databases work best for that. There are high entropy alloy specific databases that Thermocalc have, have issued, um, but we don't always find for us that they, they, they give us the, um, the best answers. Once we have that, once we've taken our massive number and funneled it down to a smaller number and then iterated those a little bit with, um, with Thermocalc, we then proceed to make the alloys. We might use arc melting, we might use induction melting. We can even use powder uh, processing, gas atomization to, to make it in powder form if we want to, because some brazing alloys are used in, in um, as powders. We can test them. We try brazing with them. We look at their microstructures, their phase compositions and so on, mechanical properties, perhaps. And hopefully well, that will either lead to, um, to good, um, good designs better designs. Uh, it might even give us some understanding, which is what we really would label as sort of physical metallurgy, basic understanding of, of how alloys work. And of course, the holy grail uh, will be if we get through all of this and actually manage to get something that, that can be used. And, you know, that's the, uh, the, the end target is seeing some of these designs come out and, um, and be actually applied um, in practical situations. So this is our approach, and we use this quite widely for our uh, brazing alloy um, design. In this particular example, the reducing the uh, the intermetallics in in nickel brazes, we um, we we took an approach where we we wanted to reduce the boron and the silicon, and uh, we explored a number of different uh, possible ways of doing this. But we found that there were some some signs that using germanium, adding in germanium would allow us to do that. And through that design process, we ended up with this particular composition shown here, uh, nickel, chrome, uh, iron, germanium and boron. So we've got rid of the silicon entirely and we've actually reduced the boron quite a bit. So this alloy is shown in atomic percent. So that's much less than the standard amount because it would be about 14 atomic percent in um, the nickel 620 grade. Our thermocalc shows indicates to us that there's still some boride present, but it's it's relatively small, um, small amount. So we hope to be able to live with that. So we proceed after the, the refinement there with thermocalc to make the alloy up. This is the this sort of the as cast, uh, just the bulk filler metal. Um, it has multiple phases, more actually phases we, uh, we find them was predicted by um, thermocalc and actually a slightly, slightly higher melting range, but still quite a narrow range, which is good. That's generally what you want for, for a filler metal. Um, so we can look, we see, yes, there are some borides in there and they're quite big borides um, in the ASCAR state, which is uh, wouldn't be ideal for, for, for a joint, but let, we wanted to uh, sort of progress this because the filler metal in its bulk form is not the is not the end goal. We want to uh, sort of analyze a, a joint. Um, the DSC lets us set a, a, a thermal profile for a brazing trial, and we carried that out um, a, a test joint on uh, Inconel 718 um, with a, a 60 micron thick filler. Um, and um, we've, these are the sort of results we found. Um, looking across the joint again, so the top, is, the top and bottom are the ink canal, and the bit in the middle is our is our filler, or solidified um, to make the joint. Uh, 
Now, if we hold it for 15 minutes, we see these uh, these phases, these big black phases right along the middle of the joint, which are borides. And that is not an ideal structure, certainly visually doesn't look ideal to have the borides concentrated along the middle. But if we hold it for longer, because boron is quite a small element, it's quite mobile, it can diffuse away. Um, so that longer hold produces a joint that, that doesn't have those, those borides visible. And in fact, when we when we sort of fully analyze the, the various different um, uh, tests we did, uh, the indications are that about a 30 minute hold time is probably going to be suitable for this alloy. Um, so far, we've assessed the shear strength. We haven't looked at the sort of the further mechanical properties that might also show some more differences. But the shear strength of the joint shows, well, actually not a not a tremendous effect of, uh, of the boride. All of our alloys, whether they're 15 minute or 60 minute um, tests, give us relatively similar results. And we're not quite at the level of um, the standard um, fillers. The BNI2 is actually an American uh, designation for the nickel 620 grade. Uh, it's the same, the same alloy, possibly due to the effect of some of these bright, uh, these bright phases here are uh, germanium phases that, that that are produced. Perhaps they're they're having a role, but um, also our joints are, are by no means yet optimized, whereas the uh, the nickel 620 composition is. So um, we we we're, we're certainly looking further at, at this as a composition. So for my uh, my second example, that's the first was talking about obviously uh, reducing the intermetallics. Um, another area of interest is to reduce the brazing temperature. Now, historically, certainly within the, uh, the English speaking world, um, there's been a, a division between brazing and soldering uh, and are set between an, an, an arbitrary temperature of 450 degrees. Uh, below that, it's soldering. Above that, it's brazing. And it happens that because of historical use, there are not many fillers around that gap. So the graph here shows uh, melting or shows temperatures for different groups of fillers, the solders and then different series of brazing alloys. And uh, the, the spots, the bottom bit is the, uh, the, uh, the solidus and the line extends up to the liquidus. So solders all have very, very similar uh, melting characteristics. And then there's this jump um, between the solders and the aluminium series of, of brazing fillers, and then it progresses up to, to higher temperatures. There's not really much in that region. If you want to process at about 400 to 500 degrees, you don't have a lot of choice. Historically, probably we didn't really want to process at that temperature, but now we do. Um, from the solders side, power electronics applications, are, are, there's more power, there's more demand placed on those. So they're getting hotter and they would like higher temperature solders. And from the brazing side, things are coming down. Um, some very highly alloyed grades of aluminium, uh, high strength aluminium, the melting temperature of the aluminium is reduced so much that you can't really use the aluminium brazes on that without melting it. And there are also some functional ceramic materials that are temperature sensitive where you don't want to heat them too much in the brazing application. And that is that latter one is um, the example I wanted to talk about here because we've did some work on um, joining of thermoelectric materials um, for use in, in automotive for sort of recovery of waste heat. So a thermoelectric material is one that generates a charge difference in response to a temperature difference. And if you uh, create the right types uh, and join them up in the right way, take the sort of the pieces of, of the, the thermoelectric and join them up into a, a circuit, um, a device um, between and place it somewhere between a hot and a cold side, you can generate um, sort of electrical power in that way. So there's a few requirements here. Brazing is a desirable technology. There's lots of joints, lots of joints between different materials that need to be made quickly. Uh, so brazing would be quite uh, desirable, but the processing temperature needs to be quite low because if it's too high, the sorts of materials that would be used for these, um, um, these thermoelectrics could be damaged. Their, their properties could be altered. 
We need a relatively high operational temperature, though, uh, because if it goes in the exhaust, it needs to survive those conditions. Um, the best fillers to do this are the silver based ones, but the problem with that is the, the silver can diffuse through um, and, um, and interact with the thermoelectric and effectively poison it, changes it, and it no longer has its desirable properties. So um, there was a case for a bit of a redesign of the filler metals in this, in this situation, and that's what we did. We used our, um, our um, design approach, and we came up with uh, quite a novel composition of an alloy, actually. There, there wasn't much data on some of these elements used together, but uh, a zinc, copper, gallium, gold, tin alloy. Um, so the gold perhaps isn't super desirable from a cost point of view, but um, we tried compositions without gold and they simply just weren't as good. Uh, there was a clear uh, performance improvement with having the gold. So in the sort of applications this would be used in, uh, you might put a, a nickel barrier, a diffusion barrier on your thermoelectric, and you want to combine that to a copper heatsink. So we did some trials bonding nickel uh, to copper. And there's our filler in between and it bonds quite well and looking at the the interface this is the copper side um, and this is the filler side the the interface actually looks quite good there's not defects at the interface the, the alloy itself looks well that's quite an interesting microstructure let's say but um the the, the as a joint it looks reasonably good um when we probe the mechanical properties it's not as strong as the, the silver fillers, but this is not really an application where strength beyond a, a very much a base level to hold the component together, it's not a structural role, so the strength doesn't need to be super high. And when we compare uh, into diffusion or diffusion into the nickel from the silver uh, based alloys, the conventional alloys and our new alloy, we're, we're a little bit less, it's all quite small, but we're, we're a little bit less, there's less going through. And probably most importantly, looking at the electrical performance, the resistance across that joint, which is what really matters for the efficiency and effectiveness of the, the thermoelectric, that's that's within the sort of the, the acceptable range. So um, that's an alloy that might well uh, be, be suitable for that use uh, once the full development of the, the thermoelectric material um, themselves is, is completed. My third and final example is about moving towards higher temperature brazing. And there's obviously, and this is a common thing in many applications, you know, you'd see it certainly in, um, um, in aerospace, in um, nuclear, like fusion, things want to go towards higher temperatures, higher than the, the current technologies allow. You can relatively easily design a high temperature alloy but for it to be a brazing alloy, it's got to melt below the temperatures of the materials that you're using. And for that reason, we might be interested in eutectic composite compositions. Um, now that obviously lets us bring down the melting temperature, but another advantage of a eutectic, particularly if it's a quite a, a deep eutectic, a steep sided eutectic, is if we can engineer some compositional change of the filler, we might make it so that actually once it's done its job, there's no low melting temperature phase left in our material. So I've tried to take, I've taken this sketch out of a paper that we, we wrote to try and illustrate this. If we imagine joining some, some base materials with a filler, we melt the filler, and then perhaps if we keep it molten, the filler might dissolve some of the base material or it might diffuse into the base material. And as it does so, it's going to alter its composition. Um, and if it's a deep eutectic, if we move away from that eutectic point, we may quite rapidly go to uh, an area where the melting temperature is above the temperature that we're at. So we might see solidification in from the sides at that um, at the brazing temperature, so isothermal solidification, and that could even proceed through until um, until we have full solidification, uh, potentially, if we leave it that long. So finding high temperature eutectics could be interesting. And it's noted, we noted, uh, others have noted, that some high entropy alloys show liquid to alpha plus beta to two-phase transformations that, that are eutectic transformations. 
Um, so there could be some interesting eutectic HEAs that, that are out there that we want to find, but how do we find them? Our, our previous search approach just tries to find alloys that are going to mix and form an alloy. It, it won't tell us if they're likely to be eutectic or not. So what we've been trying with this is we've been trying machine learning to see if it can help us. Um, we've used a, um, a random forest approach. So this is a machine learning method. Um, it's based on a decision tree. So in a decision tree, you, you, you have a data set um, and you, you split that according to a, a dichotomous um, question, a question that can either be this or that. And then you take those groups and you split them again and you keep splitting until you have different subgroups with different characteristics. And you can use that to sort of see um, if you take a new alloy, if you're looking at alloys, if you take a new alloy through that approach, which of those subgroups it ends at. That's a decision tree. And if you have lots of those, that makes a forest. Uh, uh, and making a forest helps to um, sort of uh, give a better overall prediction without over overfitting. So we, we tried this approach, this machine learning approach, um, with a data set of 40 eutectic HEAs, which are the only ones that have been reported thus far, and 170 regular HEAs. And we found that uh, in terms of their importance to that, uh, to that decision, the enthalpy of mixing was the most important characteristic, the valence electron concentration, um, and the atomic size difference was probably the next one. So actually, we're getting two of the criteria that we were using anyway for our alloy design, plus the valence electron concentration as being the most important ones. So um, we've tried this. This is, this is very much ongoing work, but we, we tried this out. We came up with a, a new alloy. In fact, we ended up with a six component alloy, um, chrome, uh, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, hafnium. Um, and we've made this up uh, based on those predictions and we found it's, it's not perfect. It's not exactly a eutectic. It looks like it's a, an off eutectic composition. So we've got some primary, uh, a primary phase, which seems to be an FCC phase, and then our eutectic, which seems to be uh, the FCC play phase plus an intermetallic. So it's not perfect. And, and certainly this is not particularly optimized as a brazing filler metal yet. But um, it does look like we've got some clues as to ways of, of finding these eutectics and hopefully we can uh, build on this and adapt our method to, to help us find some high temperature eutectics that can be used as fillers. So I'm very much coming to uh, the end of even the extended uh, time, time slot there, but fortunately I've reached my conclusions. And really I simply, to summarise, to say that brazing is um, a very old technology. You, you probably would look at it in that way, but it's, it's not a solved problem. We don't know everything about it yet. Um, modern alloy design techniques, drawing on ideas like, um, like machine learning, like high entropy alloys, can give us new compositions and the high entropy alloys certainly do have potential um, as fillers. There is there is a, uh, a US company that, that is uh, commercially um, introduced high entropy alloys as, as filler compositions, for example. And as far as I know, that's the only commercial application of high entropy alloys thus far. Um, and our goal with this sort of approach is to widen the capabilities of brazing, to, to bring it into areas, higher temperatures, lower temperatures, more demanding roles where it's not currently been used. So um, with that, I will thank you very much for your attention. And um, of course, uh, invite any questions that anyone would like to ask. Great, thank you very much, Professor Goodall. It was an excellent talk. Thank you. And so any of us have any questions? Yeah, so can I ask a first one? So, because uh, we are working on, like I'm working on some soldering stuff, and so it's oh, yeah. relatively related. So, to is even like for the last example you've shown, if we managed to get a eutectic composition, and would where would the uh, intermetallic go? Will they disappear or will they, they will be in the eutectic anyway, yeah. right? No, that that's true. So that's a, uh, it's a, uh... It's a different strategy, I, I guess. It's so each of those each of those examples is a a different area, a different solution to a different problem. 
Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's it's and and that but that is very much the way that these technologies are. They are um, all these different filler metals are adapted for a different use. There is no there is no one. This will do everything, and nor could there be really because the the requirements are are different. So um, it might be that a a eutectic alloy. Um, could be of course less strong if the if the intermetallic in it is less strong however we do we do work with um in conventional metallurgy as well as in fillers we do work with eutectics and get good properties out of them uh, sometimes so if it can be coupled up with the right kind of process control and the right kind of quantities of, of the intermetallic it could it could even be an advantage to have that that sort of two-phase microstructure it it depends like any kind of like any kind of um decision you make about a, a phase in a material it depends where it is what size it's in what the microstructure is like yeah. okay. whether it's going to be good or bad yeah thank you yeah some please Thank you very much, Russell. That's a fantastic talk. Um, just curious about high temperature um, brazing, um, in particular, of, like with moride. Um, moride, to some extent, could be kind of uh, beneficial uh, element in particular of high temperature, like a creep resistance. We all know we want to add more moride to increase the, the creep strength. Um, so when we want to design high temperature braze and brazing, do you think? Um, like a moride, silly. We don't want to have a kind of big moride, but we want to kind of diffuse more uh, more into grain boundaries, and with that, we might able to uh, increase the creep resistance. For example, mm -hmm. ha have you looked into to that kind of effect come from kind of added elements that might bring some kind of additional benefit? So yeah, we've looked at we've looked at a number of different um, compositions. We we as as you saw from what I showed there, we we've not totally removed uh, the boron. Um, we're still actually at, compared to conventional super alloy type material, we're still at a pretty high level of boron. Um, so um, we we certainly haven't taken that out. And we have done a bit of work on looking at exact trying to diagnose exactly where it ends up and whether it is in good places or or not um, the the mechanism of the diffusion of boron which we did not absolutely we did not invent this is the the the, the, the normal expectation with the the nickel brazes in particular is that um, uh, there'll be a, a concentration of, of boron to lower the melting temperature but then it will diffuse out into the material um where it's relatively tolerable to have it um so that 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 is part of of the accepted sort of process now whether there's other elements that could be uh introduced into a filler perhaps not necessarily for the immediate benefit of the filler in performing its role but the longer term benefit of of the the joint or the the alloy around the joint that's a that's a very interesting question. Of course, the mobility there is is uh, of different elements is for for the durations that the bonding takes place is is relatively low. Um, we've certainly seen things coming the other way though, um, possibly because of some dissolution of of, uh, of the the parent material. So we get niobium phases in in the joint um, after the the process, which Obviously, there's no niobium in our filler, but it's coming from the um, from the, the 718. Um, now, that's another area that we want to look at to see whether that's uh, uh, is that a positive or a negative because of, of how it's turning up. So there's there's definitely a lot of scope for more detailed understanding of that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, we have one collaboration with Column um, to understand about the, the structural integrity of Braised, uh, brazing, um, and basically we just got brazed um, joined between um, P91, which is a um, mountain stick stainless steel, and um, yellow fair kind of steel for fusion, um, and very similar to P91, um, and also tungsten as well. Um, 
so we want to understand the grip fatigue interaction of that joint. Uh, and I just curious about the kind of when we heat it up and let the element diffuse, and that would affect the the grip resistance, yes. in particular, yeah. say boron or, or some other element. Uh, and that might be, I mean, with the hand hand to be alloys, certainly we don't know uh, where the hand to be alloy can reduce the diffusion or increase the diffusion. We don't know. Very true. Uh, yeah, so so that would be I mean very exciting direction mm -hmm. to to look further, uh, in particular when you identify kind of ideal, uh, yes, yes, um, that's alloy right, yeah. for 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 soldering, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely, it does sound. I think I think that that sort of thing is really would be is really valuable. The 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 longer term understanding to feed back into that that uh, that process more more of the knowledge for the design the design loop and and things like that. What is what's good to have and what's not good to have. Yeah, 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 that's right. But yeah, fantastic uh, work, uh, Russell. Yeah, thank you. OK. Any other questions, guys? Yes, please. I can't see who is OK. Yes, please. Yeah, okay. uh, yeah. Well, actually, I'm the PhD working with Karen on, uh, on fusion ah. application of raising, so I thought I'll, I'll give my input. Yes. Um, I mean, uh, so, so I'm more on the mechanical, mechanical engineering perspective of the creation of different fatigue properties, but I've got two questions that I ask to people that know bracing is, uh, what are the best elements for, if you know about those, like that have good affinity with tungsten, uh, because tungsten is very high temperature metal, mm -hmm. and uh, because of that there is a lack of diffusion when you melt the bracing alloy. So, I mean, I've, I've found a few, but I would like your uh, knowledge of that. And yep. also, um, do, do you have any ideas how to make brace joint as thick as possible? Because even though you lose some mechanical properties, you can accommodate some more thermal stresses. So it's mm. very, uh, yes. some effects yeah. uh, that you can, I mean. Uh, yes, so there's, uh, uh, those are both very good questions. Um, where, um, so, um, there, there are, as, as you probably found out, I think gold based uh, fillers can be used on tungsten, which is you know, fantastic. It's always, always the expensive things that solve the problem. Um, the other the other the other route or the route that's often used where things are difficult to uh, to braise, difficult to join. Um, you you can move into an area called active brazing. So you don't necessarily need interdiffusion, as I showed on the one of the slides in there. If you if you get an interaction, uh, a reaction, that can be enough. That can stimulate wetting. This is this is why we can braise ceramics. There's no diffusion, but there's a, a reaction. Um, so active metal brazing takes a filler that is that has all the right properties, but perhaps doesn't wet very well, and then introduces a reactive element. Uh, often it's titanium, but people have used hafnium, zirconium, things like that as well. And that sort of uh, the idea would be as the most active element present in the in the metal, it goes to the, the surface, it reacts with the, the, the material there, forms compounds or joints or the bonds of some kind and promotes the wetting. And if you get good wetting, you should get good um, uh, bonding. That's the, the theory. Um, I'm not aware of people you having used that for uh, for those kind of joints, but it would certainly be that would certainly be a route uh, of exploration because it opens up quite a broad array of uh, design possibilities, notwithstanding the limitations that fusion um, applies to it. Uh, for the uh, the second part of the question. Um, well, sorry, can you remind what was the what exactly were you asking? Yeah, me? I mean, it's more we're trying to get the joint as thick as possible yes. to accommodate yeah. some thermal stresses and. Yeah, so there is a uh, there's different ways of approaching that. One is to one is one route that sometimes people use is to have a joint that is not capable of having a thin uh, a thin gap. So um, some of the work that, that we're doing is looking at the brazing of additively manufactured components. Now, um, the conventional wisdom, I suppose, for brazing to be good in that situation would be that you produce your component, which has a rough surface, 
and then you machine that off and you polish the surface to the acceptable, relatively low roughness level. But there is potential, perhaps, um, to, 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 to use a rougher surface that therefore won't be able to approach and controls your gap to be, to be bigger overall, obviously with, with some variation. Another way, uh, and then you, you, for that, you do need special fillers because normal fillers um, uh, might not be comfortable in a, so to speak, in a large gap. You may need to sort of adjust the, the fluidity. Um, another way, it, which is used in uh, brazing of ceramics, is to use an interlayer. So there people will do things like, uh, it's almost you have a, a triple joint or a, a trifoil as it's sometimes called, where you have your filler and then something soft like uh, uh, a well annealed copper or something or very pure copper, and then another layer of filler. And you, you join with that. So you have a joint to one material and then something that will plastically deform and accommodate your, your stress, and then another joint. Um, that can be a very effective route. Um, of course, it also potentially allows you to have different fillers on either side that might adapt to joining to different materials uh, where there are, are different constraints. But yeah, there's there's all sorts of different um, routes there. There's other strategies where people use foams. People use very thin slices of foams as interlayers or scribe the joint to provide stress relief and things like that. There's there's a lot of different approaches that people have tried. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the talk again. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the good questions about the applications. Yeah. Yeah, any? Okay. Oh, actually, uh, maybe a last question for myself. So for the machine learning, technique or a protection you are using have you account for the dissolution from the parent or substrates no no we've certainly not got to that stage yet uh compositional drift and things like that we've not looked at um really this is this is that's relatively early stage work so at the moment we're really asking ourselves the question can we predict a eutectic uh hea composition or not <laughs> um, okay, yes. the next stage so that alloy that we've that we've got there uh that I, i've shown has has got a very high melting temperature now not to say it couldn't be used there probably are that was something that i've uh, that i've picked up from uh working with various companies about brazing villa metals is almost any alloy that you talk to them about they can find some niche application where that those characteristics would be good and there are there's there's even things um an example that people sometimes choose is um normally copper phosphorus brazing materials you don't join steels with because you make you make phosphides and they're brittle they're extremely brittle but there are some applications where you actually want a joint that will fail in a known place and then you do use them. So even a joint that has bad properties, if you find the right application, that can be a good property. So I wouldn't say it's useless, but the intent of that alloy was not to make a, a filler, but more just to see, can we do it? Yeah. And if we find we can do it, we're going to progress to use um, uh, to more uh, application oriented designs. Now, uh, Along with that, we've got some thoughts about improving the model and the sort of directions that we may well go in is, is as you suggest, looking at, at how how would the composition change? How, how could the composition change and how would that affect it? Yeah, that's certainly a, at least one step, if not several steps down the down the road for us. And it's great. And it's, it's good for me. Like, no, I first time I heard like the you, you talk about the company is actually commercialized the high entropy alloy in the filler yes. materials, which is. Yeah. It's, no, it's, uh, it's a it's a good example because for for many years when um, when talking to people about high entropy alloys, the, the people who aren't in in that in in doing that themselves, one of the first questions that they come back with is, well, have a, has anybody actually used these yet? Have they have they got any applications? So yeah, certainly in in fillers it. they have. The, uh, it's um, uh, it's a. Uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, a chap called Alex Shapiro um, in in the USA. He has his he has a brazing company, um, uh, and he's he's introduced a line of fillers 
uh, that are sold as, uh, well, they are high entropy alloys and they're clearly being sold as high entropy alloy fill fillers. So, yes, they do. That's great. Thank you very much, Professor Gudo, for the excellent yeah. talk. Thank you. Thank you once again for the invitation and for the very interesting questions um, there. It's uh, also uh, uh, indicated, uh, you know, some other some other activity going on to me, which is also useful to hear about. And uh, perhaps uh, those of you who are working on soldering or brazing, there may be other discussions we can have at another time uh, about about those. Yes, definitely, definitely. Thank you. That sounds very good. So yeah, thank you once again, uh, everyone, for your attention this morning. Thank you very much. Thanks. Goodbye. Bye.